Hi there and welcome to this tutorial series on using Logic Pro X to compose orchestral film music with virtual instruments. My name is Karim Shabonkari and I'll be taking you through a step-by-step -step process that will teach you everything you need to know to start writing realistic sounding orchestral scores with your favourite symphonic sample libraries. This series is not designed to teach you how to score. Instead, it will help you understand and master your toolset so that you can start writing more quickly and not worry about software and hardware settings every time you sit down to start a new composition. You will however need a fairly powerful workstation computer. I personally run a quad core i7 with 16 gigabytes of RAM and I definitely, definitely need to tell you guys that you will need an SSD. You're also going to need a MIDI keyboard or controller and it would be great if this has hardware faders. And of course you're going to need Logic Pro 10.3 or later and Contact 5. In this first chapter I'm going to show you how I prefer to set up Logic when working with virtual instruments. And just as I open up Logic here guys, I want to apologise for the sound of my voice. I've had the worst cough and cold all week and it's completely ruined my voice but we're going to try and get through this. Okay, so in this first chapter I'm going to be showing you how I prefer to set up Logic when working with virtual instruments. So we're inside of Logic right now and I've got a track here just with a software instrument, Contact 5, nothing you know, too special, just standard so we can get working. And the most important thing to remember guys when we're working with film music is to make sure that our sample rate matches the sample rate of the audio that is used in the rest of the film. Now film audio is a little bit different from contemporary music. Normally in contemporary music we use 44.1 kilohertz, uh, you know, a 16 bit rate for CD, that is the standard, it's completely fine for music production. Now the reason we go up to 48 in the film world isn't because we want any higher quality, it's normally because when we have 24 frames per second in a camera, we need to have an audio sample rate that is divisible by 24 exactly. So there are no samples being split between picture frames when we're editing. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to go to File, Project Settings, Audio, and you'll see here a box that says Sample Rate, and at the moment it says 44.1 kilohertz. We need to click on that and change it to 48 kilohertz. I'm not gonna do that right now because it would stop this recording. Please make sure you do that, guys. I will have done it by the next video. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do, guys, is we're gonna sort out that problem that Logic has when you're playing with long MIDI notes. You know when you're playing back your score and you play it just in front of or behind the beginning of a long MIDI note that you want to hear, but because you've played it after the note happens, you can't hear it and Logic doesn't play it back. Obviously there's ways around this by bouncing the audio into place or freezing the track, but that kind of limits the usefulness that, that you know is associated with using MIDI. MIDI is supposed to be this fantastically flexible interface with, with, with instruments. And so what I like to do is I like to actually go, um, we're in the project settings menu again, but I'll show you how to get there. File, project settings, MIDI. Then you want to come to the chase tab and this kind of opens up a whole new way of working with MIDI. Clicking this notes here means that the MIDI is going to be chased whenever the playhead is pushed into playback. So what I mean by this is if you had, let's say, you know, a note that goes on for 64 bars, it's obviously not a musical note, but it's like, say you have a synthesizer that's just a droning pad or something like that. It doesn't mean that you'd have to go back to the beginning of that 64 bar section to hear the pad. You can play it wherever you want and the audio will be chased by logic. This is really, really useful. Obviously, you can imagine this must be blowing some of the people's minds and in the you know who are watching right now. This is so useful when you're working with long synthesized, you know, drones or even some string arrangements have very long notes. So I love clicking this option, guys, and it's my go-to number one, you know, kind of option that I pick. The reason it's not chosen as standard, which is must be the next question on some of your guys' lips, is because Logic, you know, it sums all of the audio together. So as soon as you hit play, there's going to be a really, or there has the potential to be a really, really loud audio peak. Obviously, this isn't very good. It could damage um, speakers or amps, but... If that is happening, it's likely that you've got a lot of sustained notes in your piano section or other you know, keyboard type instruments. What you wanna do is just come back and unclick the sustained box, which is obviously now available because we hit the notes. Shouldn't happen most of the time if you're writing quite normal pieces. Just be aware if you are getting these peaks, that's why. The last thing guys is it's a very specific option to me, but I have to go to project settings, synchronize, and then to the MIDI tab and click this option here. It's listen to MMC input. The reason I have to click that is because on my keyboard, I have a transport bar with buttons. And if I untick this, I'm trying to press the play key right now. 
nothing's happening. I need to click this option for that transport bar to work. So now I click this and I'm in record and I can play back. You know, it's exactly what I want. So that's just something, if you're worried why your, you know, your controller isn't working, it might be this listen to MMC input box that you need to check. That's all of the really essential options that I find everybody really should be clicking when they're working with MIDI. But I'm gonna go through some of my preferences now so you get an idea of some of the tips and tricks that I have when it comes to working with MIDI and, and, and writing film scores. So the first is to do with you know how regions or MIDI notes interact with other channels or other you know axes of, of movement. So if I want to just move this along and I accidentally go onto another channel, you know that can be really problematic if you have already audio that's that's in this uh, region say you have a region up here and you're clicking and dragging and you accidentally go down you've actually just destroyed that instrument to region so what i like to do is i like to make sure that all of the movement i do and, and the same you know the same thing happens in in the piano roll if i want to add a few notes in i'm clicking and dragging i didn't mean to move pitch then but i did because it's so inaccurate using a mouse so what i like to do is I go to Logic, Preferences, General, Editing, and I click both of these two options, Limit Dragging One Direction in Piano Roll and Score and in Tracks. And what this does is it just means I can't move this in two directions. I can only move it once, you know, in one direction at a time. Really, really useful. You might not find it so, but I really, really like it. Next, I'm just going to quickly assign some track colors here. So I have two different colors and I'm going to show you some of the preferences I like to use when I'm working with MIDI notes. Okay so first things first I really I've forgotten I, I just did it and I've forgotten which notes belong to which instrument All right I've got this amazing color coding up here I mean obviously in a template you have you know thought out color coding that you've you've planned and then when it comes to the piano scroll that the, the colors don't obviously uh, translate because you're working with velocity colors if this were to be a different velocity, you know, it gets even more confusing. That I have no idea, you know, what belongs to anything really now. It could just be anything. So what I like to do is I like to come and click the view button here and then set note color by region color. And what this does is you can see straight away, it's so much clearer. So you've got the orange, obviously in instrument two and the green, obviously from instrument one. Now, okay, I hear what you're saying. How do I know what velocity they are now? Well, first off, remember that velocity isn't really one of the most important factors when you're working with sample libraries for orchestral samples, because like a string instrument, it doesn't really matter what velocity you hit it with. It's the dynamics and the automation that you put into it, which really matter. More on that in the, in the next video. But yeah, I hear you. If you're on a piano and you want to know what velocity is, it's a little bit challenging to see. So the next thing I love to do with MIDI notes is I go to view again and show note to labels. And what this does is twofold. So I now see the pitch of every single note very clearly displayed. I've got D sharp two, A1, E1, and C1 on the piano scroll here. This really helps me because I'm quite music, you know, theory challenged. I wasn't really educated in it, which I think actually in some respects is an advantage when it comes to film scoring. You know, that's a whole other video. But the point is that when it comes to harmonizing melodies, I'm a little bit behind other people who would have had a traditional education in it. So what really helps here is I have a couple of kind of formulas, as it were, to, to harmonize something with. And it helps for me to know exactly what note that is in, in, you know, without having to look back at the keyboard and try and remember which is which. Really helpful. But the other thing it does, guys, you can see here the 49, 8, 114, and 87 numbers. Those are the velocities of the notes. So they're there, clear as day. You know exactly what they are. And you get all the benefits of being able to see which instrument the note comes from, what the note pitches, and also very clearly what the velocity is. So you get the best of all three worlds, in my opinion. So that's how I like to work with MIDI, guys. The last two things I like to change really quickly, let's rattle them off. I go up to the LCD up here and I go to custom. I like having all of the information that I can have. Then I come and right click on the gray here, customize control bar and display. I could have done that here, look custom up here. But what I like to do is I like to go and click capture recording. This is really cool. If I was just playing back here, let's say, and I don't have anything in there, but you can see on the piano roll there, I was just playing along. I wasn't in record there, was I? Well, now if I go and hit capture recording, that region is captured. This is really useful if you're just having an impromptu playthrough with the, with the picture um, in front of you and you just happen to play something you really loved. Click pause 
um, click your capture recording and it, you're, you set, you know, you're good to go. You can also do that with shift R. So that's a really cool little trick. And the last thing I like to do is just go to view up here in the arrangement window and set secondary ruler, just so I can see all the time where I am in terms of beats and, and you know, and, and measures as well as time code. I find that really useful when I'm working to, to moving image. So guys, that is all of the things that I do to set up logic to work with MIDI. So Thank you very much for watching, guys. I hope this has been helpful. Stay tuned tomorrow on the blog for the next article and video. And keep on composing, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.